The Sound Off Podcast. The podcast about broadcast with Matt Kundal. Starts now. This week I speak with podcast super friend David Yaz from the Boston Podcast Network. The Podcast Super Friends is another podcast that I co-host and produce with John Gay, Johnny Podcast, Catherine O'Brien, and David. Now when you hear David in just a second, you're going to know that he is definitely from Boston and definitely makes podcasts. David also hosts a podcast called Top 10 Time Machine. That's where a top 10 billboard chart from a random week gets reviewed and analyzed. David Yaz joins me from the studios of the Boston Podcast Network. David, how did you arrive in podcasting? Well, started up, as a lot of people did, I think at the time, as a side hustle. I was intrigued by the fact that any idiot could get into podcasting. And it's both the beauty and the curse of podcasting (laughs) is just the entry level. I've always been an audiophile, never really trained professionally. I mean, I was a DJ in college. I was always the guy making the mixtapes and have dabbled in radio over the years. But once podcasting started up, I started a couple podcasts and then realized that I come from the professional world, having been a lawyer and a financial advisor. There are a lot of people that wanted to get in and get some of the podcast pie and they didn't know how to do it. So with a little bit of humble investment from some friends, I opened a studio and off I went. So I've never really known anybody who dabbles in radio. I've only met people who are like completely all in. So let's talk a little bit about the radio side of things. You're, you're in Boston and Boston's got a lot of great radio stations. What'd you grow up listening to over the years? My true love was the Rock of Boston, WBCN Boston. And I had some common friends that knew some of the folks at the station there. But it was probably the first time as a young person that I really got that concept of your rock and roll personality heroes can feel like your family. And a good morning radio show felt like you were kind of listening in on whatever was going on in that morning. So we had a charming, if somewhat cantankerous guy named Charles Laquadera, who was the morning host for BCN. And he had his cast of characters. And I liked it because they were they were humble. They were good natured. If it was snowing that day, they were complaining about the snow like the rest of us. They would complain about traffic like the rest of us. The music at the time, of course, was, you know, the, the classic rock radio. And so you know, disco sucks, but got to know over the years, some people in radio. I had an aunt who was in politics named Margie Clapprood, who at one point had the number two talk radio show in Boston. And I, at the time was working for a newspaper called Lawyers Weekly, and she would bring me in as the legal guy. And we did a segment called Lawyers, Guns and Money. And then as the years went on, occasionally I would guest host for her in various radio jobs she had over the years. And I just, I just always loved it. I would probably be accused of liking the sound of my own voice. We probably all have that, Matt. But the medium, which now has, in a way, transmogrified over to podcasting, is it's fun, it's intimate. And I remember one time when I was guest hosting, I was supposed to have someone come on and do a a segment for me. And I realized she had canceled and left a voicemail on my machine. And there I am, like, behind the mic. And it's just me and the producer there staring down the barrel of 15 minutes of dead air. And I said, Chance, what the hell are we going to do? And he said, oh, you and I will just bullshit a little bit. And I said, about what? He goes, well, let's talk about why your stupid reporter just canceled and you've got no segment. Let's talk about her. And I said, okay. And he said, Dave, good talk radio is just like listening in on somebody else's conversation. So if we have a, just have a good natural conversation right now, we could do worse. And he was right. I don't know if you ever heard that credo. It's pretty simple, Matt, but the best radio shows and the best podcasts are just like, you know, it's the reason why we care about what's going on and Howard Stern's office and whether he's about to fire an intern or something like why should we care about such things is because it's a good natural conversation and they let you into their family. What station was your aunt on? Because when I think of Boston radio and talk, I think of WBZ. That was it. BZ or RKO? I think it was BZ. I mean, BZ was always more of the morning radio show, but she was on a show called Claproot and Whitley. She was the Claproot of the group. And it was the first time I had ever heard the yin yang of liberal and a conservative. My aunt's a bleeding heart liberal. And this guy, Pat Whitley, was an old school radio conservative, of which, of course, there were many. And for a while, they were the, the number two show. And then eventually that radio marriage turned into a divorce, as will happen. They had a pretty good run, though. <laughs> oh, back when liberals and conservatives used to talk to each other, you mean? Yeah, because, you know, then and maybe now, too, you're a better person to ask, Matt. But for some reason, 
But I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this. Why do conservatives always win in radio and liberals seem to use? I don't know if it's lose. I don't know if it's different in, in Canada. No, it's true. I mean, was it Al Franken and Air America at one point? They launched that and it garnered no ratings. I think some of it is taken up in the public radio space. So I think some of the listening is already over there. But I guess I think conservative talk has now become such a brand that it's, it just works on radio. And I think the type of talk that comes out from, you know, the left of center and off in the left, it doesn't have that same clash that wrestling does. I mean, I used to think radio was wrestling. I still think radio is wrestling. Just the same way that, you know, you had the liberal and conservative, you know, discussion in your family that was going on on WBZ or RKO. You know, that, that makes for great radio, that clashing. But liberals don't like to clash. They want to try to convince you to, you know, come over to our side, as it were. Yeah. By the way, it was RKO. And in fact, I think WBZ maintained the number one spot during those years, but RKO was a close second. But I think you're right. I remember that Air America thing, and I I was optimistic about it. I think Mark Marin was involved as well, but very short-lived. And when I used to be in the newspaper business, there was that old rule that the number of, well, it was an undeniable pattern that the people that wrote in letters to the editor were generally pissed off about something. You just didn't get as many letters saying, hey, nice job. And I don't know if this is a strike against my uh, all my conservative friends out there, but it seems like conservatism lends itself more just to being angry, you know, <laughs> and, and liberals, they get angry, too. Of course, there are plenty of things they get angry for, but they're a little bit more about the love and that conflict. You know, it really fuels every form of entertainment. So maybe that's just the way things are. You mentioned that you did some newspaper work. So what did you do at a newspaper? So I was uh, a very strange and eclectic background. I've failed at many things, Matt. I was a lawyer for a short while, and then a job opened up for a reporter at the local legal newspaper, which is still around, Massachusetts Lawyers Weekly. And I sent a resume in, and I said, help me. I'm a writer trapped in the body of a lawyer. I always had a creative streak, but an analytical mind. And so the analytical mind was enough to prompt me to go to law school and thought, I'll figure out what I'm going to do after that. So I ended up at that newspaper for 15 years and I ran the place for the last seven or eight years. And you'll appreciate as a person who has a creative outlet, it was something of a dream job. Now, meanwhile, I'm in the legal arena, so it's not all fun and games. And some of the stuff we were publishing was was really dry. But we at one point were purchased by a company called Dolan Media, which, by the way, I always have to say is no relation to the New York Jim Dolan of the New York Knicks. Our Dolan Media was actually owned by a guy named Jim Dolan as well, different Jim Dolan, but He owned a lot of trade newspapers across the U.S. and he taught us that it's good to try new things and he that he expects us to fail. And so we were able to try, you know, new magazines and new events. And I created an event called Battle of the Lawyers, where I invited in a half dozen lawyers who had tried prominent cases and had them recreate their closing arguments for the uh, entertainment of the fans and education, I suppose. And then even, you know, at the tail end of my run there, I, I started podcasting. That was probably around 2009, maybe into 2010. And that was when most people didn't know what a podcast was. And it was fun. I don't know if everybody got it at the time. I still think some people still don't get podcasting, but it was, it was a good fertile creative ground for me. And so it was, it was to me, it's kind of a natural entree into podcasting. Was that your first? Yeah. We started like the lawyers weekly podcast and I just brought two reporters into my office with you know, the, one of those horrid Yeti blue microphones that is supposed to catch everything in the room nicely and it didn't really, but at the time it was passable. And we just talked about the stories of the day and just, just had them shoot the breeze. And we did have a captive audience, so we might have had a few hundred people listening to that thing. But the thing about podcasting is, I don't know if you agree, I think in a way we're still in a wild, wild west. In other words, the rules seem to change from year to year. And if you don't like the rules, just make it up. If you want to do a 90-minute podcast, do a 90-minute podcast. If you think a 15-minute podcast is more compelling, then do that. No rules. When you say rules, you sort of mean best practices, right? Like, what's the best way to get a podcast out there? So when you think back to, you know, 2009, and you've got the Lawyers Weekly podcast happening, and then you think about some of the things that you're doing today, what were some of the things that you did back then that you look back on and go, wow, can't believe you were doing that, aside from the Blue Yeti microphone? I suppose my first reaction is that the more things change, the more they stay the same. The best shows I can remember back then were just really good conversations with interesting people coming in to tell their stories. So eventually I left Lawyers Weekly and stay in the podcast game. 
uh, created a show called the Boston Podcast, which still exists. I still do it. And we started out just by finding interesting professionals. The moment I remember was we had Whitey Bulger's lawyer in, and he's a guy named Jay Carney, who was I was friends with over the years, you know, big time criminal defense attorney in Boston, of course. And he did like the sound of his own voice. He, he was he could be accused of being pompous or arrogant, but he was always very interesting. And he came in and started telling us about Whitey. And this was at a time when Whitey was in prison, but before he had left the earth. And so the case was closed in a way. But lawyers are always a little tight lipped. Even the bombastic ones tend to not tell you too many details about a case. But he came in and started telling us about his first conversation with Whitey Bulger. And I'll never forget, I said, uh, Mr. Bulger, you're, you're accused of killing these people. And he had a laundry list of Whitey's alleged victims. And Whitey said, well, let, let's go down the list. This is uh, the lawyer telling us, right? He, sa- he said, this guy, no, never heard of that guy. That guy, yep, yep, that was me. But you ask anybody in Southie, that guy was the biggest asshole in the world. He deserved it, right? And then he said, hey, you go down, he'd be like, oh, I remember this one. We walked up to the guy and and we said, guess what? And he said, what? And we said, you're dead. And Steve Flemmy shot him in the face. And so to right away get this, this story about his first meeting with Whitey and for him to tell us all these details, we were shocked. And we thought that was going to go viral. And we probably got about 500 downloads, which at the time maybe wasn't so bad. But it taught me that if you get the right person talking and just let them go and listen and ask good follow-up questions, you're going to have a good show. And that, that part continues to be true. I, I think you'd agree. What's the moment when you're saying... I think I can make this a company and make podcasts for people. I'm not sure there was a a single moment, but when I first started, I think I had two clients. There were times I always felt like Jerry Maguire with having, you know, Rod Tidwell as his only client and just barely keeping a float. I I thought if I could keep one or two clients, then I'm still going. And I had a show that I continue to produce called The Cannamom Show. This, This woman who was just very interested in the women in the cannabis industry and I had a divorce lawyer named Evan Shine, and they both really took pride in their shows. And so when I realized I could find people that were as passionate about this as I was, and they just wanted me to kind of take them along their journey, that's what became exciting. And I think, Matt, you and I many times have talked about the sad phenomenon of pod fading, and it's, it continues to be rampant in the industry. In other words, so many people come in with guns all ablaze saying, I'm going to have the greatest show in the world, and they record for five or six weeks in a row, then you don't hear from them for some reason. And, uh, oh, you know, life got in the way. And so, but there are people who it is genuinely their pride and joy. And it's just fun to talk about what can we do next season to shake it up? Can we create any new segments? Can we promote it differently? Can we create a new intro? Can we get different guests? And so that was probably the moment when I realized as long as I find people who are passionate about their show, then I'll be in business. You have a great story involving, I believe, Evan Shine, who had a divorce case that involves parents where one wanted to vaccinate the kids and the other one did not. And that actually went to court for discussion. And there was, I believe, a judgment that came out of it. And, you know, here you are sitting on a podcast and an opportunity to promote this podcast with a landmark case. It was. And that was a cool moment. And Evan Shine is, in fact, the same divorce attorney I I referenced earlier as, as being one of my my oldest clients. He's into his third season now. And he, in fact, had a case where his client was in court saying, hey, my spouse, I don't remember which side he had. Sorry about that. But my spouse refuses to get the kids vaccinated. My spouse refuses to abide by the rules of COVID that we're supposed to be abiding by. And I don't want to let my kids go to my ex's house if, you know, the kids are in danger of getting COVID. And it was the first case, and the judge ruled in Evan's favor and said, no, you, you, there are certain things you have to do if you want to continue to see your kids. So that was a cool moment. I'll, I'll admit, I don't think we capitalized on that big enough. We did talk about it on, on Evan's show. It might not be too late to go back and revisit that case, but it was cool to stumble into a news story like that. Anytime you get that, of course, the natural inclination is to think, well, now a bunch of people could be listening to your show that haven't been listening before. And... It's a theory that I think, Matt, you'll agree, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, if you if you get a great guest or a great moment, the hope is that the listener will come for the guest. Like, well, hey, you got Conan O'Brien on the show, you got whoever on the show, but then they'll come for the guest, but then they'll come back for the host because they, they think, you know, that guy does a good show. I'll, I'll listen the next time he gets on. It doesn't always work, I think, as, as you would admit, Matt, that you can get a spike for a single episode, but nevertheless, it's something that, you know, those moments where you're like, this is going to be a great show. I can't wait. 
And then, you, you know, hope, at the very least, you get some good feedback and you get some additional attention to the show. Yeah, you know, sometimes people just don't want to consume said popular guest in audio form. Maybe they just like the Instagram pages. Maybe they just like to connect on video or they already feel they know enough about the person that they're not going to get anything more out of this. So it, it, it is a bit of a mystery why that happens. And I think especially with the case with Evan, a lot of it's just timing. And a lot of it might just think, you know what? It's Massachusetts. That law doesn't apply to us out here in California or in Texas or in Canada. So they might not gravitate to it. Then it doesn't mean that the show doesn't have to, you know, get popular, you know, now it could get popular later. Well, that's true. And that, that, that is the thing that I tell a lot of people I work with is it is something that differentiates podcasts from, from radio and maybe any other medium is the way people discover it is, you know, I don't know, but when I find a good podcast, I'm kind of excited if there are like, you know, a year's worth of episodes that I haven't heard. I don't care that they're old if it's information I'm, I'm interested in, but. What you said about, you know, maybe I know everything I need to know about that comedian or that personality or whatever. That is one of the the simple byproducts of podcasting is I'm a, a little bit of a comedy nerd. And just for example, your countryman, Martin Short, I'll usually listen to anything he's on. But if I ever meet the guy, I hope he doesn't, you know, start to launch into the story about how he was on the Tonight Show sitting next to Betty Davis, because I've heard him tell that story about a dozen times on various podcasts. And it's kind of a plus and minus. You get to know, you, you feel like you get to know some of these people, but you know, eventually those long form interviews, it's going to go over the same ground. In just a moment, we're going to get into the podcasts that are too long. Is there such a thing? Specifically, we discuss David's podcast, Top 10 Time Machine. And if you've ever worked in music radio, it's a podcast you might find interesting. And by the way, I've posted a whole lot more about this episode on the episode page at soundoffpodcast.com, including a transcript of this episode. Transcription for the Sound Off Podcast is powered by Podin. Your podcast is an SEO goldmine. We help you to dig out. Start your free trial now at podin.io. The Sound Off Podcast. As we record this, you're, uh, by the way, a diehard fan. You're wearing your Patriots shirt this morning on a day where I just got back from Green Bay, and Green Bay won in overtime against the Patriots, who put up a good fight. But to that point, my wife's a big Aaron Rodgers fan, and I don't know where she would find the time, other than an 11-hour drive between Green Bay and Winnipeg, to listen to two and a half hours of Aaron Rodgers talking with Bill Maher. <laughs> well, that, does, that sounds like something I would be interested to hear, because we know Aaron Rodgers is on the eccentric side when it comes to certain things, and Bill Maher is just the cynic to call him on all those things. <laughs> Was it a good interview? Yeah, it actually is the second time I listened to it, but it was the first time that she got to listen to it. But it speaks to the fact that even though you might be a diehard, you know, Green Bay Packers fan, you might not have two and a half hours of your life to go and spend to listen to the whole thing. You know, this happens all the time. Oh, I'm going to listen to that later. And then people don't listen to it. True. Yeah. And, and it's the nature of, of on demand listening. And yeah, of course, it, it happens to all of us. A year will go by, you'll be like, oh, you know, I meant to listen to that thing. And then you probably don't bother to go back and find it. But, you know, in the in the old days, pre-podcasting, you just didn't have opportunities like this. And so, you know, maybe I'm being Captain Obvious here is like we know our celebrities and our prominent people in our community a lot better than we would have otherwise back in the old days. Because in the old days, if you like my favorite baseball player growing up was Red Sox, Carl Yastrzemski. And when I first got into baseball, he was already kind of a sturdy veteran and just seemed like such a cool, calm leader on the field and off the field come to learn later apparently the guy was kind of a jerk and used to sit by himself and smoke cigarettes i don't think he would have thrived in this world you know i don't think he would have a lot to say on a podcast but then again you know when you get those great long form interviews they're just golden you're on the edge of your seat this one hasn't aged well but there was a i guess kind of a legendary episode of mark maron's podcast where he interviewed louis ck and the two had had a feud in the past and over the course of two hours they kind of hashed it out. And that, that was, you know, I, I would, you know, go to where I was driving and stop and sit in the car and listen to the rest of that thing because it was just so compelling. What's your infatuation with top 10 charts? So much so that you have past 10s, a top 10 time machine. Did you always follow the charts when you were growing up and listening to the radio and buying cassettes and records? Oh, yeah. Big time geek. Casey Kasem fan, you know, would be glued to the radio on Sunday mornings to come out or Saturday mornings, whatever it was. And, you know, I had a friend in college and we knew we were brothers in arms and we knew we had similarly music nerd proclivities. 
when I don't I forget if he asked me or I asked him, but it was a, it's a trivia question. It was what song in the U.S. Billboard chart holds the record for the longest number of weeks in a row spent at number two. And he said, oh, well, that's waiting for a uh, Farno song. Waiting for a girl like you by Foreigner. Waiting. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. And we both knew. We both looked at each other and we both said physical because it, it was trapped behind physical by Olivia Newton-John, which was number one for so many weeks in a row. And so we thought if we're the only two people on the planet that knew that and remembered that, we, we need to stick together. And so, you know, in recent years, he came to me with the idea. He said, what if we did a music podcast where we, quote unquote, went back in time, just looked at the top 10 on a given day and then give some people some context and it'll be a fun way to remember that stuff and what has held up and what hasn't. So, you know, we have a humble but very loyal audience. We're still continuing to grow that show. But I think it's a good example of if you're passionate about something, it can keep going. Matt, you and I were on a podcast that you have so deftly curated over the last several months, the podcast Super Friends, and we talked about potential podcast marriages and divorces. And so immediately after we did that episode, I checked with Milt, my podcast partner, to make sure we weren't close to a divorce. And we both said, well, I still enjoy it, don't you? And he said, yes. And so to us, that has become a creative outlet, something we're proud of, and also just a great way to keep in touch with an old college friend. He's in New York. I'm in Boston. We don't get to see each other that often. And so we hope that I think the people that like the show enjoy the fact that repartee between us is genuine. It's not fabricated. It's not one of these like, you know, "Eh, it's Buzzsaw and Johnny in the morning. We're best friends here. You know, it's hopefully it's not like that. I think one of the best things about it is it's unnecessarily long. (laughs) <laughs> guilty as charged yes but you guys don't have any rules between you and if you start putting rules on one another about hey we got to shorten this up and lengthen this up it doesn't become as much fun anymore yeah so the podcast consists of us going through those top 10 songs but milt is a research freak so he likes to give all facts and most of them very interesting about the origin of songs and where this came from and you know, I didn't know until he told me that that song 8675309 Jenny, which is by a, a band called Tommy Two-Tone. I didn't realize Tommy Two-Tone isn't an actual guy. It's a band. So that's just one example. Like I was shocked when he told me that. But it is long. They do go as long as, as two hours. And Matt, we have taken great pains to figure out a way to cut it down. And I, I suppose in a way, to our credit, We might have been justified recently when we put out this survey that has dual goals. The one goal is to try to poll our listeners as to what the greatest songs of all time were. And it invites our listeners to go down a list of about 200 songs. And we tell them, you don't have to rate everyone, but rate them as you see fit. But then it asks for feedback on the show. And we had a multiple choice question. How long should the show be? Should it be about 30 minutes, about 60 minutes, or just as long as it takes? And so far, overwhelmingly, they're saying just as long as it takes. So we don't make it long for the sake of making it long. We make it long because we're covering the stuff we need to. And as long as it's moving and still kind of a natural conversation, we still feel pretty good about it. So I don't know. I mean, do you listen to any podcasts that are super long? I mean, the new media show with Todd Cochran and Rob Greenlee, that's 90 minutes. I mean, I consider that to be long. That is long. I mean, we do an entertainment podcast. And by definition, that means you don't need it. You don't need it. I mean, if we were doing some kind of business and you, you do a lot about the, the industry of radio and podcasting. And for a lot of people that listen to your show, Matt, I think they do it for education. It's almost like they're taking their vitamins. They want to make sure they know what's going on in the industry. And if that's the case, you know, going to be in the car for about, you know, 30 minutes. That's about the length of the show. Great. Makes sense. With ours, I mean, they say you generally listen to a podcast for one of two reasons. You, you need the information or you just want the information. And if it's both, then great. But I can't pretend anyone needs to know too much about my Sharona by the knack. You know, they just might enjoy going back and listening to some songs with us and taking the trip with us. So they can also, as many will do, pick and choose. You know, if we're going back to 1966, that might not suit everyone. They might feel more comfortable with Cindy Lauper and Dexy's Midnight Runners in 1984. And so listen to that episode. And if you don't want to listen to the whole thing, of course, don't. But, you know, we, we take the unusual step of posting it on a Friday because we, we think people tend to listen to it in their car driving around on the weekends when they have downtime or then just sitting around. So that's the theory so far. But, you know, like I say, things change from year to year and we constantly try to rejigger the, the format. We, at one point, we decided the best way to go for a weekly podcast was to do one of our mega Batan death march shows of up to two hours, but then stagger them week to week with a shorter show of about an hour where we do some kind of specialty show, like the best songs containing cowbells, or we did, you know, our favorite deep cuts. Last week, we did the best mashups we've ever heard. Why does it take you two hours to talk about 10 songs? (laughs) 
because we love our we love our doodads. We love our, our jingles. We have way too much fun with them. We thought about cutting out certain things at the top of the show. If the time machine, you know, we, we there's this silly conceit where we play a sound effect and say, oh, we're now we're going back in time. Now we're back in 1985. And Milt will, you know, spend about three to five minutes talking about what was going on in 1985. And to me, there were always interesting things like, oh, I, geez, I remember that. Or I remember Bernie Getz or I remember when so-and-so did that on the Grammy Award show or whatever. We do that. Then we go into the song. I mean, each song with each song, he's got some research. We evaluate and then we can't resist doing these things at the end. Like we rate the week. We pick a winner of the week. There's a part where I break in and say it's time for the play date where I'm going to quiz Milt on a certain category song. Listeners can play along at home. I mean, we've gotten it down to like a minute 45, but that's not bad, right? (laughs) I know it's long. What's the most unlikely number one song that you've come across? One that you said, I just can't figure out why this song got to number one. There was a song, I want to say it was called In the Year 2025. Uh, or maybe it was in the year 50, 50, yeah, 50, 55? 25, 25, yeah. 25, 25, that's it. Zager and Evans. Yes! Oh my God, Matt. Major points for that one. That was probably the most bizarre moment. So that song, and I was able to quickly check the interwebs here, came out in 1969 and hit number one. And it is this bizarro kind of meandering song, imagining a day in the future and I think they go through the lyrics. They talk the first verse is about what's going on in the year 2025. And the next one is about in the year 35, 35. So, I mean, that's one that was very bizarre. I'd say the most pleasant surprise is when we stumbled upon this song, which was a hit. So, I mean, all these songs were hits. So it's always a little weird when we've never heard of it, but sung by the Osmonds called Down by the Lazy River. And we think of the Osmonds as these, like a toothpaste commercial come to life. You know, these Mormons just being happy and so. This song, Down by the Lazy River, it rocks. We were both dancing to it. We couldn't believe it. So it's, it's fun to unearth, like, fun surprises like that. What is the worst year of the 1980s, and why was it 1981? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who tortured you in 1981, Matt. It's a lot of ballads. Yeah, I mean, 1981 was probably before the 80s got really shiny, is the best word I can think of. I'm talking about, you know, like, you know, Cindy Lauper and Kenny Loggins, Footloose, and Huey Lewis. I mean, those were all fun. I mean, a lot of them are silly songs and they're campy, but if you hit the right groove, I'll still listen to The Power of Love by Huey Lewis in the news and enjoy it very much. You know, I remember the song. I remember Back to the Future. I can picture, he's another one of your boys, right? Isn't Michael J. Fox Canadian? Yes. See, this is, we can't trust you people because you look like the rest of us and sometimes we can't tell. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, 1980 was, and 81, those, are, those early 80 days, the decade had yet to sort of hit its the fun portion of it. There was still some sort of crunch rock hanging around. You know, I remember the Clash and bands of that ilk. The ballads are actually a sticking point between me and Milt because Milt will be more forgiving than I. But we've hit so many Lionel Richie ballads that it's like I can't help myself. I get out the vomit sound effect and <laughs> a bad ballad is worse than anything because it, it feels like it never ends. Do you have one that that most sticks in your craw? I mean, right in that transition point between 81 and 82, really doesn't kick into the spring of 82. And and I think we call this, I I think it's the MTV effect where stuff starts to get better. And then the British were releasing, you know, some more keyboards and they hadn't killed disco the way America had. So Don't You Want Me Baby was still, you know, that's still a cool song. And it goes right alongside Eye of the Tiger. But you still got this residual stink of Charlene, I've never been to me. Oh, we covered that one, yeah. We have a sound effect that says, what the F were we thinking? And that merited that badge. Of course, that song was famously featured in the in the movie. The movie, which is much better than the song, uh, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, which was, if you haven't seen it, folks, is the best movie you'll find around about drag queens making their way to the Australian outback. Very strange movie, but lovable. But yeah, we spent a little time dissecting what that actually means. I've never been to me. It it doesn't exactly make sense in addition to being just kind of a brutally sappy song. I mean, I respect her needs to go and find herself, but does she have to do it for three minutes on my favorite radio station? Yeah. And you know what? Now that you, you bring this up, it actually brings up what is kind of a fascinating concept to me, which I'm sure somebody has studied this. But, you know, by the definition, the top 10 hits are pop. It's what people are enjoying. But it begs the question, who are these people? 
And during different eras and different years, there might have been different ages of people listening to the radio. So why does an Air Supply song make it alongside a song by, I don't know, ZZ Top or something? It's because your parents, they were listening to the radio too. (laughs) They needed something to listen to. And so it does blow my mind because it is Drek. Much of it is is Drek. And so, yeah, I'm not going back listening to, uh, I've never been to me too often these days. I don't mean to sort of look at all the podcasts that you work with and say there's a bit of a pattern, but you've got an awful lot of professionals up there from real estate. You got a couple from, you got about three or four there from legal and a few business. And now I see you've even got one that involves cryptocurrency. So safe to say that you're heavily centered around professionals. That was the plan originally, just because I personally had come from the legal world and and the financial world. And so my grain of a business model was that those people in the professional world are going to want to market their services through podcasting. So that has worked to some degree, but it goes to show you how it's almost like there should be different words for because a podcast that, you know, I do for a divorce lawyer or an accountant or a speech coach is going to be a lot different than Joe Rogan's podcast or Adam Carolla's podcast or pick a podcast that is, you know, at the top of the charts. It's almost like they're just not the same animal. And, I, you know, I tell people, please don't think you're going to be the next Joe Rogan. That's the biggest mistake. But think about what you want to do. So, you know, a lawyer, a business person, you know, someone who's an expert in crypto, perhaps they are creating the podcast for the purpose of getting their name out there a little bit in the same way that you get your name out there by what? Going to cocktail parties or attending conferences or speaking at conferences. And these are places where you've got a, a so-called audience of like, you know, 200, 300 people, and that's just fine. And you just kind of keep doing that and you get your name around. So it's not the same as like an entertainment V. It's almost the difference between Wayne and Garth in their parents' basement doing the cable access show versus like Monday Night Football. They're just not the same thing. But that doesn't mean they don't serve both great purposes. And that's, as I said, the beauty of podcasting is it has a relatively low entry level. And if you want to be really good, you can with some creativity and why not create the best show that you can? And so like, you know, Evan Shine, the divorce lawyer you mentioned that I work with, you know, he's doing it to elevate his name in in his industry, but he also loves the idea of making a great show. So we mess around with different kinds of segments and intros and outros and other things that are going to jazz the show up. It's the Boston Podcast Network, but you also have some takers of some equally obnoxious fan bases like Chicago and Philadelphia. That's right. I just want to make sure to hit all those fan bases at once. Yeah, no, you've got them. And yes, each fan base is more rude than the next. I mean, Boston fans are known as massholes. New York fans are, well, I mean, it's New York. And Philly fans, you'll know Matt, of course, are famous for booing Santa Claus. And they would do it again. But, uh, you know, it's when I started the company, to be frank, I, you know, like a lot of entrepreneurs, this is the first company I've ever owned. You kind of throw a lot of spaghetti against the fridge and see what sticks. and so. I named the company the Boston Podcast Network in part because no one had that name, (laughs) but being centered in Boston and having that as sort of ground zero of my podcast world made sense. But, you know, I get introduced to people all around the country who want podcasts. And of course, this internet thing allows you to, to do things seamlessly. So we proudly produce a podcast called Binge or Cringe, which is Philly based and a very passionate woman with a background in PR named Jamie Joffe. But Frankly, it's all about television. And the fans are a lot of people who were on message boards talking about how they love the show, The Affair. And she just blossomed that into a, an extremely well-traveled Facebook page and now a podcast. And proud to say that podcast just won Best of Philly from Philadelphia Magazine. Congrats. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll take that. David, thanks so much for being on the podcast and sharing your podcast experience, your radio experience, your music chart knowledge. And I guess we'll be listening to you in podcasts. I hope so. And may I say, keep up the great work. What you do is, you know, you have just a, such a unique, cool corner of the radio and entertainment world to do this podcast, which is I know about the industry and so many other things. But listeners will not know that I secretly follow Matt and try to copy what he does because he knows what he's doing. So I hope you don't mind me being your occasional mentee on this ride, Matt. I don't mind saying. Oh, listen, likewise. Thank you. Thanks for being a podcast super friend. <laughs> I will see you at the Hall of Justice. Don't forget the secret password. The Sound Off Podcast is written and hosted by Matt Kundle. Produced by Evan Serminski. Social media by Courtney Krebsbach. Another great creation from the Sound Off Media Company. There's always more at soundoffpodcast.com.